Welcome to the Sona Sorelis podcast. In this episode, we talk to Lou McGregor, a Bendigo-based singer-songwriter I can only describe as warm, genuine, and grounded. Lou is a prolific songwriter and captivating performer. She won multiple songwriting competitions early in her career and is known for being the lead singer and songwriter for the band Louis and the Pride. She also dabbles in ambient electronic music under the moniker Longley Lane, and these days she's performing solo. I recently saw Lou perform live in Melbourne and was blown away by her amazing voice and thought-provoking lyrics. In this chat, Lou talks to us about her musical journey and generously shares useful guidance based on years of performing and songwriting. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe. I've got a ton of great interviews just like this one coming up and I'd love for you to be part of my journey. And without further ado, here's Lou. Lou McGregor, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Thank you for having me. So I thought we'd start off with a little bit of background and get a sense of your evolution as an artist. Um, How did you get into music? Oh, uh, that's a good question because I don't remember ever getting into music. I just always was always was from there's a tape my mum has a tape that my auntie taped of me when I was like three singing like a version by Madonna um and it's hilarious because I can barely speak it's just you know (laughs) I was always obsessed with music um the other day I got one of my old records out and I got so excited because I remember holding it when I was really little and reading the words and just being so into it and I put it on and you can't play it. It's totally ruined and I realise it's because I was little, constantly turning it on and off and probably rewinding the little knob to put it back to the song that I liked or maybe even the bit that I liked. I was always into music. But I got into performing when I was in high school and had glandular fever and my mum, I couldn't couldn't speak, let alone sing, and my mum got me a book, a music book of um, Jewel. I always played piano but not well and I didn't enjoy it at all. And this particular book had the sheet music and she was like, oh, look, it's got the sheet music, you can play it instead of singing it. And I wasn't interested in that but it also had the guitar chord shapes on it. And so I was able to, with all this spare time on my hands because I couldn't go to school, sit with my mum's guitar and work out what the dots on the chord charts meant and play. So I think that's when I started being able to play and sing for myself and so that's when I started playing and singing at school, school concerts and stuff like that. I had a really good friend who um, is now my sister-in-law who loved to do the same and we used to teach each other harmonies and stuff like that. So developed from there. Mm, so you've always been surrounded by people who love music and you've had an internal passion for it and, and it seems like your family was also musical. Yeah, my family were very musical. My my mum's one of seven brothers and sisters, so there was a lot of socialising with them on the weekends instead of, like, I don't know, other friends and stuff like that. Um, and all my aunties are a lot younger than my mum, so they're closer to my age, so they were sort of, teenagers when I was really little and they were all really into music they had boyfriends who played guitar or they played piano or whatever and so the family gatherings would sort of start with everyone hanging out and having something to eat and then someone would pair off into another room with a guitar and then someone else would sort of join them and eventually we were all in there having a sing harmonies comedy songs like people just making up funny things uh, Good times. Like I really, I think that is a big part of maybe my love for music, I think. And performing. Yeah. I did used to put on shows for them. <laughs> did you to, did you I've got a song to my turn. <laughs> la, la, la. <laughs> Hairbrush, the words. <laughs> so you, you also met someone, a, a friend who shared a similar passion and that set you down a, a different path as well. Yeah, well, that was yeah, it was probably about around the same time that I had the glandular fever and all that sort of stuff. About fourteen, um, yeah, I made friends with this girl who had exactly the same taste in music as me. Oh my goodness, it was just like such a joy to find someone else in the world who knew who Tori Amos was, or um, you know, knew the deep back catalogue of Crowded House and 
Fleetwood Mac and stuff, it was probably in the era where everyone was like, yeah, just Nirvana, it's cool, you know. So it was it was an absolute godsend to meet this girl, Nova, who was in Louis and the Pride. Um, and, of course, I ended up marrying her brother years later, so <laughs> that's a different story altogether. <laughs> but, she, yeah, she, was in my, she ended up being in my band and we used to do – all sorts of music together. We had another friend who was this amazing piano player and we used to jam at school and she helped me get into music school. She, when I was auditioning for Box Hill, she helped me learn the little bits of theory that we needed to learn because we didn't learn no theory at school in music class. Um, uh, and if I hadn't been surrounded by these girls, I don't think I would have been able to get into all the little different steps that lead me along the way. I'm sleeping in on Sunday just because I want to I'm listening to Coldplay dreaming I could hold you The sheets are soft around my skin with every morning And who'd have thought I'd miss the sound yeah, music is really embedded in your family and friendships in your personal circle. It seems like it's been a lifelong journey in that regard. Yep. Yeah, it really has. Like there's no no moment without it. Um, my kids are even hardcore into music. They They all perform in different ways too, like my daughter's into musical theatre and she's amazing and my other daughter plays piano beautifully and sings. It's just my little boy just loves to beatbox and rap and stuff and they go off and do this music club that my husband runs up here where all the kids of the area sort of come together on a Saturday. He says it's like a football club but without the toxicity. (laughs) So even, even... Even if I took my own music out of the picture, it'd still be really embedded in my life. Really, like, what's better with music? You know, you can be in a foul mood and get in the car and hear a song that totally changes things. I can be in the supermarket and hear a song that I love and go, yes, (laughs) love this. (laughs) I just think, I just think, how did people go without it? How did, have you ever met someone who just didn't like music? Who just wasn't into it? No. No, I haven't. I mean, I've had disagreements with people about what kind of music they like. but Yeah. Yeah, well, what makes that happen? I don't know. It's so weird. But I, I've met a couple of people that I go, oh, you're just not into it at all. At all. Where do you get your joy? <laughs> Where do you get your little spark of, oh, you know? I, I don't know. I couldn't be without it. Yeah, and, and music for you is is not only about, you know, performing and fun and, and, you know, connecting with family. It's also about the emotional connection that you have with, you know, the lyrics, the music itself, maybe even demarcations of, around different points of your life. Yeah, and like um, even on a, a deeper sort of internal level, um, I can sort of monitor my mental state a little bit by what's going on. So I know if I don't want to listen to anything, there's something wrong. I know if I'm like, no, I uh, don't like that. No, I can't. Mm. I'm not right. And I probably need to go for a big walk, have a good chat, do something to get back because I'm, it's, a, it's an indicator for me. Um, but I also know that, you know, some music helps me imagine some music like sparks different things for me it's just without all of that going on into even internally just for myself I can't imagine how I'd be Mm. that's such a fascinating concept that if your openness to music is a bit of a barometer about how you're feeling Mm. Mm. and I've noticed it in my kids like one day one day we were on the way to school and my daughter wouldn't fight with me over what song we were going to play. I don't care. You just play what you want. And I went home and I said to my husband, something not right. She's not right. And we were right. It's it's obviously not everybody does that, but I've noticed that for myself. 
also I don't know how I would go in life without writing. That's the other thing. Like I feel like that's my little bit of therapy even sometimes. Yeah. Your ability to express yourself. Mm, yeah, that's a big deal because you can say things and they you can describe feelings and I don't think you can get it across as well as maybe you would if you heard it in a song. I've heard songs and I've gone, that's how I feel. <laughs> that whole thing is how I feel about that whatever. Um, and I don't know if just words can describe that. Chasing the lines of the past that we walk Chasing the lines of the patterns we talk And given Should that, what, what kind of things do you tend to write about? Uh, well, that's a good question. I write, again, just whatever happens, it comes out. Um, but... I don't know, a long time ago it would have all been heartbreak or um, a, a new love or that's, it's you know, emotion, strong emotion-based things like that. But as I've sort of gotten a bit older and, you know, I'm in a really happy relationship and I've got the babies and stuff, it's the strong emotion, the, the triggering sort of strong emotions that would force me into writing a song are not that anymore. So I guess now... Uh, I write songs about how how I'm feeling about different things that happen, like events, um, different perspectives, phases. Um, the I've had times where situations have gone on with friends in their lives that have made me write a song. So I don't I don't know what technically about. But I'm trying to think about recent songs I've written. I recently wrote a song called I Don't Write Happy Songs and that's because my parents were always saying, write something boppy. Come on, write something boppy. And I'd be like, I just don't feel motivated to write when I'm thoroughly happy. There's no real need. So <laughs> A lot of I people say song. that. Yeah, I wrote this song called I Don't Write Happy Songs and it's about all the things that make me happy but I don't feel the need to write them. And it's all the little daily life bits and pieces that like, like how cute my dog is when she lies on her back and does a little squirmy thing and, you know, stuff like that. Random little things. Um, I, I, I did write a love song not that long ago. My husband would, he heard a, a song that he really liked from somewhere and he went, isn't it a shame that you, you're probably not motivated to write a new love song anymore? And I went, oh, oh, I can. I will and I can. I played it the other night. That was it's called a long drive. Um, so that I did I did write a, a love song recently because I was like, no, I can, I can do it, and I do still feel it. So why not? It's just you don't feel motivated to. Fifteen, sixteen years later, um, I've written songs about moving in and out of. Um, life phases that's definitely been a thing um yeah just that's probably the, the most I can say on that I don't know about specific topics but I do write about how I'm feeling about things that's probably the answer there you go <laughs> yeah I, no that that's a, a good answer um and it's so I guess one of the questions in relation to that is it seems, it seems like recently there's been more sort of external motivation to write um, because your parents have noted, you know, you don't write a happy song and your partner's, oh, you know, you haven't written a love song in a while. And That's actually a really interesting point. And then maybe in the past it's been internally motiv motivated. And there's probably just that outer layer of age, you know, as you get older. Could be. It could be. Different priorities, you know. Yeah, it could very well be that that is that. But I think also... When I, I probably don't mention it, but when I'm writing songs about how I'm feeling, they would be a bit more ambiguous. Like there's songs about feeling drained, just drained. Or just the other day I wrote a song about feeling guilty, about feeling depressed. Um, so, yeah, sometimes I get a little trigger from someone else that says just, hey, what about this idea? And it either, it either goes 
sparks something in me or it doesn't. Um, and that's all songs for me. All writing either comes from a little spark or I'm, I'm not doing it. Um, so it's, if, you, if I go through a dry spell with writing, it's because I haven't, haven't noticed any, oh, ding, 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 there's a song coming, you know. So that's what that is. But I do, I, have, I still write very much from my feeling just like, but I couldn't call them any particular topics sometimes. So some, well, like one song is uh, where I had a dream I was so happy in the dream and it was in a really dark sort of phase for me and I was so happy and just I was just sort of floaty and I woke up and went oh I'm back into that oh you know and then I wrote a song about it so yeah like a, a lyrics first person or a music first person or a bit of both depends I'm um, definitely a bit of both because um, I feel like sometimes the lyrics take a bit of work but they usually uh, sometimes sometimes I'll sit down to practice a cover song and I'll play a chord and I'll go oh hang on that feels like something else what is that it's a different feeling oh I'll put the cover song to the side for a second and I'll go and I'll sort of delve into what's coming with that chord and it might be a line and that might become a song based on something I've had an idea about weeks before and written a couple of notes in my little notebook that I carry around with me. I might go, oh, oh, that goes with that and I'll bring that and put it in with it. But then sometimes I will sit down and I'll go, oh, what's that? And then a whole song will pour out easily. It's bizarre. There doesn't seem to be a lot of rhyme or reason to it, <laughs> except that it always starts with a little feeling of, oh, something, there's something there. Yeah. How do you think your art form has changed over time? Um, I think I really just have learnt to not try to do anything in particular I think when I'm being formulaic, I, I don't feel connected to what I'm doing. So I think in the past maybe I'd go, oh, I've done that chord progression a few times. I can't do that anymore. I have to do something different and then I'll try and make something different like, and go, come on, do something more like such and such, whatever. Um, and then I might get a song out of it, but I don't feel connected to it, so there's no point. So now I sort of just literally go with whatever I feel like and I will follow the path of um, how it feels. So, for example, if I were to write a song and then go, oh, no, that's the same chords as a song I've written once before, I'll go, whatever, just go with it and see what happens because I, I, I think I've got less time to put into experimenting with what I don't need. I now, now I just go, no, I just do what's coming and see where that leads me. And I think I've learned, that's a learning thing. I've learned to do that lately because out of necessity. And you've developed a confidence in just going with your feeling and intuition rather than over, yeah. over analyzing and yeah. yes, self judging, definitely. self being self critical. Oh, I was reading a book not that long ago called The Artist's Way and she talks about uh, self-doubt being a killer for your creativity. It's just it's not your job to judge what you do. It's your job to do, to make what you make and then just leave it out there, see if anyone else likes it. That's up to them but that's not your job to think about whether it's good or, you know, and I really liked that. I thought, well, I wonder how many songs I didn't delve into in my past because I went, oh, no, 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 that's not what I should be doing. Yeah, and, and has that been a theme for you more broadly throughout your songwriting career, I guess? 
Mm, maybe. Now that I think about it, quite possibly. Yeah, yep. it, it's it's something that all musicians struggle with in one way or another. And, you know, it, it's hard to be uh, yourself sometimes as a musician. Yeah, because, you know, there's fashions in music as well and we don't like to think there is, but there really is. Um, even just if I was to go to listen to live music anywhere at the moment, I would hear the females singing in cursive. That's just how it is. They're yeah. all going to do this, boys. Yeah. Um, and the blokes... Well, I, think Blake, I wonder if, I don't know if it's like a freedom thing or what, but they don't seem to follow vocal styles as much. They sort of just do what they do. But, you know, if you, if you look back at different eras, you'll see the way melodies are structured over time is really fashionable as well. I was learning an 80s song for a friend for their wedding and it's, when you're looking at it as chords and lyrics and a melody without all the 80s production, wow, that's really interesting. That's really, who, how did someone think to put those chords in that order with that melody line? I find it fascinating. And the 80s was really prominent for that. It just really was. And then things sort of are a bit more simple now like just four chords and then a lot of production but four chords and a melody is still awesome stuff going on but the really popular stuff that's how it is and so I've, I've, I've for years gone oh that'd be daggy don't do that and now I go just do whatever whatever who knows what I've missed I completely agree with you there is a formula it's oversimplified and everything's overproduced um, in order to maintain people's attention. Yeah. Yeah, probably is it. And even even uh, in live performances, not so much listening to, like, the radio or Spotify or whatever, um, even just live music, it is different. I suppose also wherever you move, like whatever circles you're moving in, it's it's very, um, it's still fashionable. It's, it's just is, there's little fashions going through all around. That's why it's really great to do open mic nights because you get to hear how other people's brains are just working just to be creative. How would you describe your songwriting style? I don't know. <laughs> um I, when I'm applying for things and competitions or festivals or whatever and I'm asked this, I don't know how to answer it. I will say acoustic pop. I will say modern folk. I, I, I definitely don't know how to say that because it's not like, wow, it's so different, you can't, can't define it or anything. It's just it's singer-songwriter stuff. And I don't know if that's technically a genre, but I make up a song and I, I sing it with a guitar, you know. Um, some of my recordings not necessarily like that. So did you get to listen to anything by Longley Lane? Yeah, yeah, I, I listen to everything. So yeah. That stuff is my um, outlet for exploring productions, like full effect stuff because when I was younger I really did like things like Massive Attack and Porter's Head and yeah, I did hear that. air, really ambient sort of beautiful things like that and I've just got this friend who's just the most amazing little sort of, I call him a mad scientist because he's in his little cave making stuff up and we get together and I'll go, here's this song and he'll go, oh, yeah, I can hear this and this with that, that'll be good and then sort of delves in and gets to work and then he adds his weirdness to it um which makes me sort of feel like that satisfies that side of my my music and that would be i would call that uh ambient pop or synth pop i don't know i open my eyes at a quarter past one to the moon and the sky the sun Deja vu Repeat offense Where I've belonged All along 
Yeah, and it, it's kind of like your your evolution as a as a musician, having it be something that's embedded in your family life. You know, you're very comfortable with performing. You're someone who seems like you're very dedicated to developing your skills as well. You're not someone who just sits on your laurels and kind of goes, "This is my thing." You're always trying to evolve it slightly and bring people in so you're developing as well you're learning from others as much as possible yeah you're only as good as the people you surround yourself with I suppose I haven't always been like that I think I did sit on my laurels for a while and I feel like this urgency in the last five years to get going get moving do do what you love doing because I realised it does, this is what brings me joy and let's explore that, see where I can go with songs. I can relate to that sense of urgency and there's this kind of, you know, during COVID. um, Yes. Yeah, a lot of people reflected on their, yes. you know, where they ended up in life and, you know, things slowed down for, for a lot of us. Um, some people not so much because they chose to be busy in various other ways. But for a lot of us, we, we it was a point of significant reflection for a couple of years. And when you can't do music, how do you feel about that? Depresso. <laughs> I hated it. I hated not being able to. Do, we ended up doing online concerts. Because my husband was like, yeah, do something. <laughs> and you can, we got to figure this out. And it was cool. Like I'd get my kids in on it. They'd do a little, be a Saturday, sec, every second Saturday night, we'd do a little concert. And just all my friends would sort of get a glass of red, tune in, and we'd just all sort of hang out online. It's not the same and it didn't feel the same, but I had to have a little something and it really, I'd be interested to hear your view on it. But for me, it really made me realise that it has to be a priority for me because that's how I connect. I'm not a very social person. I'm not the sort of person who's going to choose to plan parties and go out all the time. I'm just not. I would prefer to be by myself at home. And obviously this is how I connect. I really missed it. Really did. I realised I couldn't do anything else I didn't want to do. I didn't want to not do music ever again. <laughs> and so how have things changed since you made that realisation? Um, I remind myself frequently that I felt that way. So when things get really hectic, because they do, there's not a lot of, obviously if I have a family and I'm really dedicated to my family as well, in order to fit all of the the songwriting, the practice, gigs, recording, um, promoting, all of that, I have to just fill every gap of time that I have really. And I go, okay, well, I'm buggered. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do it. And then I go, no, you do. You actually really do want to do this. This is going to energise you. Remember when you couldn't do it? Remember when it was forcibly not a thing you could do? take that on. So I actually, I'll be packing my car some days and reminding myself how much I missed packing my car to go off for a long drive to a gig. And you're off to Hillsville today. I am. Off to Watts River Brewery. Give them a plug. And so is this, you've been performing a lot more than recently? Yeah, pro- probably since lockdown. Yeah. I made it a made it a thing to make sure that I was doing what I like, doing more of it. And as someone who's actively performing, what are you noticing about like how things have changed since, I guess, before COVID or? Do you know what's so interesting? I don't think people know how to be when there's live music in a venue. So I go to wineries a lot. I do a lot of wineries because I'm just that sort of sound. And people will come in and they're very, got my wine, hmm, cheese platter, hmm. And they'll, they'll, I'll see toes tapping. I think, okay, so they don't hate it, <laughs> but there's no clapping and there's no sort of eye contact for the first little while. And then after a while, after a couple of wines of sitting probably, if I'm being honest, 
I will notice people will start turning their chairs around and they might even like one of them might start a clap and if if one feels like it's okay to clap then other people will too and that sort of thing um so I've noticed that I just I, I wonder if people because I spend a lot of time going am I rubbish? Why don't they like me? <laughs> and then I think, no, they're not comfortable. They don't know what to do. And then sometimes I'll be playing in a market and I've learned, I look for the children to make myself not, or old people, or old people to make myself go, you know, get out of your own head. Stop thinking about whether it sounds rubbish or not. It's okay. Just play, just play. And look for the little kids. So the little kids will walk by and they'll go, or they'll dance or old people will stop because they've obviously, I reckon, learned to stop in their years, have figured out that you've got to stop. And they'll sort of sit there and they'll look at me and they'll, I'll listen for a while. And they'll go, as they walk away, you know. So I feel like maybe it was COVID. Maybe it's just time. I don't know. But something's different. Um, and every now and then you do get people who are, like a whole group that are like, yes, live music, yes, that's what we're here for. Woo, bring it on. But just I'm talking about in my work, so covers music, um, you know, original music's a different thing. And original music's, I don't know, how do you get people to go to your gigs? That's the new thing. Um, especially being a little bit older, I'm not new and exciting. It's not people aren't coming along because they think I'm going to be something at some stage and they want to be able to say they were there at the start, you know. It's if they come to my gigs now, it's because they want to just enjoy what I do and they, they like it and or they're my friends and they want to support me. I don't know. But um, for original music, I'd be really interested to continue watching your podcast when you're speaking to people because I don't see a lot of actively people wanting to go and see live music that's new to them. Yeah, and the, the intention of this podcast is to raise, not just raise the profile, but I think archive the profile of people who are doing amazing things like yourself because I don't think anyone's really taking time to do that. So a simple conversation like this, connecting with Lou McGregor, who, you know, someday might be really, really famous, might be mildly famous mm. or might be forgotten. Mm. Not that I hope that yeah. never happens, but, you know, that's the reality of the, the world. That's right. So, you know, it's important that we capture these moments in history where people are, because it's happening right now, right? Yeah. And as I'm actually really grateful. I think it's a great idea because I really loved watching Kate's one. I thought it's really good for an artist even to be able to sit there and see how other artists feel about things. It's really interesting and a lot of similarities. Nice to not feel alone. Absolutely. And there are there are a lot of similarities. And I think also um, it's an opportunity for people to learn how to talk about themselves without feeling self-conscious, particularly musicians. That's a, that's a very good point. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good point. It's really weird. I'm lying flat, I'm on back as I wait for the sun. So, Lou, you've got a, a lifetime of experience in music, writing, performing, and that's had various impacts on your career as a musician. And you've kind of come out uh, from COVID wanting to do more and you're feeling hungry. What wisdom would you offer someone who's either starting out or similarly like you going through a bit of a rebirth? Um, three things. I would firstly decide whether it's something that you can't live without because I was having this conversation with my daughter the other day. If you can live without it, then just do live without it. Do something else because it's very soul destroying at times, at times. It's little bits. So 
I don't want her to deal with that unless it's something that she absolutely has to do and then also gets the massive joys out of it that I do. Um, everything balances out then. But if you're not 100% all the way, don't put yourself through it. <laughs> it's, it's too much, too much. Secondly, I would say if I could say to myself one thing, go back in time to sort of do things differently, I would not sit on my laurels. I would not wait for something to happen. I don't think it's going to ever be that way anymore. I don't think people are going to go, okay, wow, you're amazing. Let's give you a recording contract and put you out into the world. I just don't see it happening anymore. I think maybe Tones and I might have been the last person that I can think of that really happening to in Australia, um, like really well, like successfully, like as a big recording contract sort of thing, go out and make your own, go out and make your own uh, stuff happen because I don't think it's going to be given to people anymore the way the way the industry works. And the other thing is if that's, if you're doing all that, I like to find someone who's above me in their career um, who's, successful or having the sort of successes that I want um, and watch what they're doing and copy it, not not musically, but in putting yourself out there or in, in, in other aspects, um, yeah, find that person and go, yeah, that's the sort of career I want to have. I might try and move in the similar ways as they do. Otherwise, it's all, we're all just out here swimming. <laughs> it's just like... I don't know. What do I do? <laughs> so the takeaways are be certain. Yeah. Create your own fate. Yeah. And look for mentors or someone yeah. to look up to because it's important to. That's a much more succinct way of saying it. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's great advice. Absolutely great advice. Well, Lou, thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for inviting me.